213 BC. King Aegis Caesar of Haps Castle is about to be dethroned. Arkan Londor, his top advisor from a powerful line of mercenaries, has gathered 1,000 of his sellswords outside the capital. He merely needs to give the order, and Caesar's reign will end. But instead, he boastfully strides into the palace with only two guards to secure a personal surrender from the powerless king. It seems Aegis Caesar will be made to beg for mercy, but at the last minute, a miracle. General von Io, inexperienced, fiercely loyal to Aegis Caesar, and 30 years of age appears from the depths of the palace. He had discovered the insidious plot three days earlier and raced to the capital undetected. Now he kills Arkin Londor's unsuspecting guards and holds the usurper at sword point. In shock, Arkin tries to head for the door, beyond which stands his army. But Von Io is too quick, and Arkin falls dead. Seizing the moment, Aegis Caesar cuts off the head of Arkin Londor and goes to confront the army. Soldiers, I am dissatisfied by your conduct. You stand in my plaza, threaten my family, and forsake your sacred oath to follow me into battle. Disperse now, or you shall join your foolish commander who dared to threaten me in the will of my people. It's a bold tale, and in reality, he more likely simply paid off the soldiers with the funds he had on hand. But whatever the truth, he ultimately dispersed the army. But while the attempted coup fails in Habs Castle, it succeeds in the West to devastating effect. Generals Onam and Trest, Caesar's top commanders, are caught off guard and slaughtered, while their loyalist armies are made to surrender. Aegis Caesar, it appears, has only escaped death for a moment, but he has never been one to give in. In one last desperate attempt to save his kingdom, he gathers 500 ragged men and turns to the only general at hand, Von Io. Outnumbered three to one, it seems as if the campaign is a foregone conclusion. But in the coming battles, Io will shock the world, for the war has only just begun. As Eo organizes and equips Caesar's 500 ragtag conscripts in Habs Castle, news reaches the Londorian camp of Arkin's failed coup. General Darkin Londor, a 32-year-old inexperienced commander, has 1,500 men spread out to occupy the local towns and villages. He was supposed to have commanded the finances and internal security of Habs Castle once his brother took over but now he has been thrust into a leadership role well beyond his abilities. Nevertheless, Darkin acts prudently, asserting his control and rallying the troops to avenge their fallen leader. Soon, he will be able to concentrate his forces. Eo knows his only hope of victory is to strike before this can happen, so he plans an audacious and rapid advance to the central position. There, he will have split the enemy army, and can defeat each section in detail. With no time to lose, he cuts his training short and begins a rapid advance. But within hours of his departure, a torrential storm begins to thrash the army, as soldiers are drenched and roads turn to mud. Eo's offensive is in danger of being swallowed up by the storm. Even so, he presses forward. Halting the advance would only give Darkin time to mass his troops, and he knows that the enemy must also be suffering from the terrible conditions. Eo's army trudges onward, but the driving rain is exacting a heavy toll. The column quickly becomes strung out. Those who lose their way or cannot keep up are abandoned, 
Some even drown in the thick sludge. Boots and packs are abandoned en masse. At one point, while the army is crossing a swollen stream, a sudden violent surge of water sweeps many men off their feet. Ten drown, and dozens more are left stranded. Nevertheless, the beleaguered column pushes on. Finally, after a 20-hour non-stop march, the 300 survivors arrive at Iterak, where fortune at last smiles upon Io. Three enemy couriers, holed up in the town, are caught by surprise and captured, their valuable intelligence brought to headquarters. They inform Io that the enemy are still divided, entrenched in three separate camps to wait out the storm, with not the slightest inkling of his advance. Despite his men's exhaustion and the ceaseless downpour, Io decides to attack. He targets the weakest force, a 400-man vanguard near the town of Akstetten. Through speed and surprise, he hopes to overwhelm the camp before the other two armies can react. At 1 a.m. on the 20th of June, Io sights enemy campfires through the rain. He finds they are situated on a shallow hill, known locally as the Mole. It is a formidable position, surrounded by a boggy, impassable quagmire stirred up by the rain, with only a single raised path that leads to the camp. What's worse, Io sights a welcoming arch at the end of the path, a traditional Londorian symbol constructed for the anticipated arrival of a high-ranking general. No doubt that Arkin and a significant body of troops are planning to converge on this position. But there is hope. Against a backdrop of campfire light and pattering rain, Io can see men dining in their tents and hear them singing. There are few guards, and those that can be seen are huddling next to tents or by fires. Then, Io's only scouting party that he had sent out ahead of the army, just eight men strong, return with excellent news. The marshland directly opposite the road appears to be traversable. With no time to waste, Io springs into action. First, he sends forward a troop of 30 archers into the mud to fire arrows into the encampment. In the din of night, their shots were very inaccurate, but a few struck home. Alarmed and drunk soldiers begin to spread panic and confusion. Many fail to grab weapons or armor. With the enemy camp in chaos, Io unleashes a column of 200 men down the narrow road. They find the camp entrance unguarded and surge into the camp. Londorians, with their white undercoats, are easily picked out by Io's levies and are cut to pieces. The commander of the camp soon regains partial control and tries to lead the survivors out the relatively traversable pathway. Eo is ready for this. He sounds a horn and a mass of 70 infantry charge up the far side of the hill. Those who are not killed surrender. It is a crushing victory. Cheers are up throughout the camp as Eo's levies heap praise on their commander and loot the enemy tents. But Eo is not yet content with his victory. He is still outnumbered more than three to one, and even with total surprise, his men have suffered 40 casualties. But now Eo recognizes a unique opportunity. Victory had been so complete that the other columns likely believe that their men are still in control of the camp. Banking on this factor, and knowing that the welcoming arch means Darkin is on his way, Eo orders his men to put on the white coats of their fallen enemy and lay in wait for them to arrive. They don't have to wait long. As the storm dies and the sun crests above the horizon, the glinting of metal weapons and clattering soldiers can be seen and heard in the distance. 
To Eo's immense satisfaction, Darken himself rides at the head of the column, lulled by the presence of the welcoming arch, undamaged and pristine, just as Eo had ordered. What's better? Darken has fewer than 100 men at his back, having ridden well ahead of the rest of his army. Darken walks straight into camp. He is soon flanked by Eo's men, disguised in the white coats of the Londorian army, and standing in purposely sloppy formation. Darken, unimpressed by the display, leaves the column to speak with what he believes to be the staff of the camp, intending to berate them for the poor condition of their soldiers. Now Eo gives the signal. Concealed forces rush out of nearby tents to block the exit. At the same time, Darken is seized at sword point. Eo's men then break from parade formation and charge. Without leadership, their exit blocked and surrounded on all sides. Darken's men surrender en masse. It is an astonishing achievement for General Von Eyo. In the past eight hours, he has killed or captured 500 of the enemy and taken their leader hostage. But it has come at a heavy price. 70 of his men have fallen, many more are seriously wounded, and the worst has yet to come. After interrogating Darken Londor, he learns that most of the rest of his forces, some 900 men, are due to arrive in the late afternoon. They will certainly be aware something is horribly wrong and come in armed and ready. No amount of audacity or strength could change the simple fact that Eo has barely more than 200 men to take on these 900. But to the general and his men, retreat is not an option. A sense of unity and determination, akin to a religious fervor, has swept the army. They are prepared to fight until a glorious victory or a horrible end. With the total backing of his army, Eo devises a cunning plan. 